welcome. It's lockdown day two, uh, lockdown two, day one in England. Welcome to Campbell Tickell's webinar on engaging with customers. Um, and thank you for joining us, whether that's live or listening to the recording later. We're here to talk about customer engagement. Um, historically, the profile given to resident views in policy and practice has gone up and down. Events leading up to the, the fire at Grenfell Tower in June 2017 seem to highlight the worst case scenario of residents understanding and describing risks to their landlord and the warnings going unheeded. Events at Grenfell have rightly caused organisations and policymakers to question policy, methods, motivation and culture. Here at CT, we work on these issues from a variety of angles, including co-creating and reviewing customer engagement strategies, supporting and mentoring residents involved in governance, and working with residents to deliver effective resident scrutiny. Our experience is that too often the main focus of resident engagement comes down to a small group of dedicated residents drowning in paperwork. As individuals, our opportunities to express our views as consumers of services have changed massively in the last 20 years. I think one of the questions for today is what lessons can we take from those experiences? It's also interesting to ponder the implications of the last nine months for resident engagement. The big question being, if we can shift our operations to working from home, surely we can do the same for resident engagement. In the next hour or so, we're going to hear from five fantastic speakers, starting with Darren Hartley from Tarot, followed by Catherine Little and Martin Lund talking about the See the Person campaign, then Nicky Morby from CT, and finally the Housing Ombudsman, Richard Blakeway each of whom will address the subject from a different perspective. There'll be a short Q&A after each, after each speaker and a further Q&A at the end. We'll get through as many questions as possible, but can't promise to get through them all. Um, please submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A box. And if you see a question from someone else that you like, please give it a like in the Q&A box as that will push it up towards the top of the list. We will finish at a quarter to two. So that's enough from me, so let's get going. Our first speaker is Darren Hartley. Since 2016, Chief Executive of the Tarot Trust and who in 2018 was Chair of the Residence Voice Working Group as part of the Hackett Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety. Darren, over to you. As John was saying, uh, my name's uh, Darren Hartley. I'm Chief Exec of uh, the Ten Charity Tarot Trust. And uh, firstly, a big thanks to Cameron Sakel for inviting me to speak today. Um, on uh, new approaches to customer engagement. Uh, when I was asked to kind of think about the kind of things that I might cover, cover in this uh, presentation, th there was just so many things. So what I hopefully will do is provide a, a kind of a whistle-top tour, um, just the kind of the key themes, an overview, broad brush approach, and then if you want to uh, dial down into any of the issues afterwards, then we can do that in the, in the Q&A. Um, I guess the, the theme of the theme of the present, which has pretty much been the theme of the recent years, is a period of challenge and change. Um, obviously, we've got COVID, Brexit hasn't gone away as well, and then we've got kind of almost generational changes that we've got in the sector. Um, so building safety, planning reform, new funding models. And then let's not forget the continuing requirements that are already in place, but which some people may have taken their eye off the ball in relation to existing tenant, tenant involvement um, requirements, such as the tenant involvement and empowerment standard from the RSH. So, um, and then as we look to the future, I guess there's the imminent white paper, um, somewhat slow on the heels of the 2018 green paper. And um, so hopefully we can kind of have a think about some of the things that might be coming out of that as well. Uh, I think what, what's very clear, as John introduced uh, in the introduction, that uh, a greater focus on consumer regulation seems inevitable um, and is highly welcomed. So if we think about kind of stigma and isolation as the first of the theme, um, yes, we'll hear about the See the Person campaign. Um, one of the See the Person campaign supporters, WHG, uh, has recently launched the H-Factor programme. So I'm really interested to see about this, how this uh, develops as an example of um, how they're kind of applying social prescribing, uh, focused on health, happiness, confidence, self-esteem, and the very sort of broader holistic approach to, to um, meeting the needs of, of, of tenants. 
And, and I guess the message there is that landlords have a responsibility to promote positive images of tenants and promote a culture where tenants are, are, are highly valued. Of course, things go wrong. Um, uh, they'll want redress and we'll hear from Richard later um, a little bit more about the work of the Housing Ombudsman but certainly uh, Tower of Trust was involved in the development of the Complaints Handling Code and we hope that that is, is uh, being well received by the sector. Uh, obviously many of you will be preparing and finalising, fingers crossed, your annual reports which is under the new requirements and I guess I'd just ask the question how many of you have actually been involved involving residents in the development of, of, of that annual report? Uh, we do a lot of advocacy work and um, through that, I guess if we're talking about complaints issues, one of the main problems we continue to see is where landlords outsource some of that work to the contractors. And I guess that some of those contractors, whilst your procurement processes might be great, they don't always fit, have the exact same culture and approach that you might have. There might be inherent um, interest in protecting the contracts and we often see that leading to to delays in the process so i'd sort of encourage organizations to think about um who which third party organizations are involved in that pro process um, and are creating any barriers to that to the approach um to to um kind of a rapid redress of, of issues i mentioned annual reports but let's not forget the annual reports reporting requirements of the rsh dating back to 2010, are still there. And, and I mention that because if the white paper is going to be involved, uh, increasing requirements on consumer regulation, proactive um, regulation of those issues, these are things which have been around for a decade. So they, they'll be taken for as a matter of course that they should be well embedded within the organisation. When I talk about embedding, it's very much again about this culture of residence engagement. And we can see uh, some developments that we've had. Uh, with so Tarot Trust was involved in um, the housemark review of performance um, and there was the launch of the new star survey earlier this year um, which is now centered around perceptions and a five-star rating but okay i guess the takeaway point from our involvement was the key 12 percent difference in tenant satisfaction that you can get from transactional surveys versus perception and i guess if you're a board member and know some board members which are joining today um, what level of assurance can you get from the type of questions that are, that are being asked Building Safety Bill, uh, we do loads of work on this, we've been involved in some, some uh, workshops with tenants. There's a whole new regime, obviously yes, it's the key focus of our high risk buildings, but we've got the broader changes to the control regime, and enhanced powers and sanctions. Um, I've got some slides that will accompany um, my talk where I've got some examples of good practice within that which will be distributed afterwards. Uh, and again, you can link to some, some of the examples I, 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 I point to in there. But the takeaway point really is, is that you should already have been gearing up for increased transparency. There's going to be a requirement for engagement strategies, but these are not the kind of engagement strategies that you might have had before. These are going to be building specific engagement strategies. They require you to have enhanced knowledge of both the buildings, structure and the people living within them and the response if there's a crisis situation arising. Um, we've got, um, and, the, and there's increased responsibilities on residents. So actually think about whether you're going to take a policing approach, which I'd encourage you not to, versus a kind of more collaborative approach where um, tens can actually be part of the process of monitoring, of being your eyes on the ground, and actually being the methods of communication to get the messages out there as well and there are responsibilities there around appliances uh, so where you've got to maintain any appliances in your homes which could include kind of white goods if you've got a repairing obligation to maintain them actually what i, I lay down the question to, to landlords what are you going to do about um, maybe helping support tenants in testing the safety of those um, appliances and if there's any problems with those appliances have you given some, any consideration to what you might do to address some of those things, such as um, hardship funds uh, to assist with replacement but safe appliances um, about the quality of life of the tenants um, in, those, in those buildings? Of course, there's going to be a superhuman building safety manager who's appointed, who's going to have this whole host of technical knowledge, but also people skills. Have a think about how you're going to be able to marry those two um, things together uh, within not necessarily the same person, but within the same function. And that kind of links very much with recent examples about coronavirus, about the requirements for improved real-time data, 
about levels of knowledge and support of your tenants. And actually, therefore, what we really are seeing is about more contact and more sophisticated contact with, with tenants to inform your strategies and your policies and your approach to delivering services than ever before. Greater levels of, of contact and conversations. Um, so finally, just to sum up, um, I guess the big thing is the culture. Tenants have a really valuable role to play within all elements of decision making in the organisation. Um, so um, you need to really invest and welcome that. And that's about a culture throughout the whole organisation. Um, we can provide some assistance and support with, with that if you want to. Uh, we're particularly interested in if you could signpost tenants or tenant groups to us about some of the issues which I've touched on today, uh, especially around preparation for response to the um, um, anticipated white paper. And also any good practice where you're actually... Um, so that we can showcase where you've actually where you've managed to do some really good work in this area because we'd like to highlight that to MHCRG as well. So um, as I said, there'll be slides to follow with contact details. Drop me an email if you can uh, get in touch and, and offer anything around that. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Darren. Um... One question from, we haven't had any questions from uh, attendees as yet, um, but a, a question from me, could you say a bit more about the 12% difference in transa transactional survey scores? Yeah, so, so this was the idea that as, um, if, you, if you get in touch with, uh, I mean, it's, almost, it's kind of self-explanatory really, that if you get in touch with a tenant who's just had a repair done and said, are you happy with the services we provide? They're much more likely to say yes than if you contact them more generally about the perception of the organization. That's good and that's important. And, and there's a role for that type of feedback and, uh, and certainly value to that. But if you then base all of your assumptions on, oh, we're doing a great job, uh, then actually there might be some broader issues where you've, you've not actually been in contact with, with other tenants um, for quite a long period of time. And their perceptions of you might be different. Also, their needs and their support needs might be different as well. And if they if they have changed over time. So if you could, for instance, set an example of having contact with everybody in some way over, say, any 12, given 12-month 12 period, then it gives, a, and there's lots of opportunities for doing that, then you, you can just increase your overall awareness of, of um, uh, needs and awareness and support, especially in the coronavirus times where people are isolated um, and facing additional challenges ar around around that. Yeah, thanks for that. I I, I think I view that slightly differently. I, I but but broadly, I agree that that transactional surveys they only gain you a certain type of insight, and it would be a mistake to think that simply because you're gaining that type of insight, you've covered off all your insight needs. You know, yeah, that's, that's really my point, John, is, is that it's got a role, but, but actually you, you need a plethora of different roles. So just like um, widespread so online-based um, contact is really important, there will remain tenants who can't engage in that type of process. There's also, to get a better understanding of, of issues, sometimes there's still a role for having in-depth dialogue and conversations with people. And we, we saw that in, in Grenfell as a, a, the most sort of disastrous um, um, outcomes as to perhaps not having those more in-depth, um, detailed di dialogue with, with tenants. And it's when you get a richer understanding of the types of services that you're, you're providing. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Darren. That's been, that's been a real... Uh... Uh, really useful insight. So we'll keep moving. Um, next up is the two-hander, two perspectives on the national campaign, See the Person. Um, and the first is from Catherine Little, who is Executive Housing Director at Broadland Housing Association and a board member of TPAS. Catherine, over to you. Thanks, John. As you say, I'm going to do a bit of a double act with Martin, who's chair of the See the Person campaign. Before I start, I actually want to pose a question to attendees, which I know is cheeky and the wrong way around, but I don't care. <laughs> I want to ask if you think attitudes to social housing have changed during the pandemic. And if so, what role have we as housing providers played in that for, for good or ill? 
Then I want to go back to basics a little bit. What is stigma around social housing? Um, the See the Person campaign was set up as Benefit Society in 2017, I think it was, Martin, um, to tackle the stigma around social housing. What is that? Well, stigma is a form of stereotyping, negative stereotyping. And stereotyping is, in essence, cognitive shorthand. It's where your brain goes, I can see something, I know what that is, therefore I can jump to a conclusion, which you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right to have cognitive shorthand and to um, uh, speed up your thought process. If you went back to first principles every time, um, you know, getting to the end of a thought would be as slow as the vote count in Pennsylvania. If I see a snake in the outback in Australia, it's all right that I go, that's venomous. I'm not going to pick it up and give it a cuddle. That's okay, even if the snake is not venomous and I've, I've misjudged it. It's when you start to apply those stereotypes to people that you get an issue. If I see someone and I make an assumption based on the way they look, based on my either conscious or unconscious bias around um, who they are and who, uh, the way they might behave or how they might be, then we have a problem. And I, I think it's really interesting to note that um, we see cognitive shorthand, we see stereotypes in our media even with very decent stories about social housing, really positive stories, you can end up with quite interesting images used. Picture editors use images as a way of um, giving shorthand to their readers to say, this is what this story is about. You're interested or you're not interested. And two that come to mind, um, not to do with social housing, are uh, the, the image that many mental health campaigns uh, really campaigned against, so the, the kind of head in hands, as if mental health only affects people when you can see it when in fact we know you know most of us at some point in our life will suffer from uh, mental health issues be it you know light stress through to full-blown depression and it's not about head and hands I could be sitting here smiling and you don't know what's going on the other image that's discussed a lot on twitter is the uh, the gray uh, alleyway with a little girl in a red coat running along it which seems to be used just everywhere as shorthand for either poverty or the North, or you know, if they're really doing well both. <laughs> um, the same applies to social housing. And I do think there's been a bit of a shift, but it used to be if you searched on Getty Images for social housing, you would see boarded up windows or um, people in sleeping bags on the streets, the really kind of cutting edge of homelessness. That seems to have changed a little bit, but I do think it's interesting to see the kind of shorthand that's used in society. Because what we're talking about, and we talk about stigma around social housing, is societal stereotypes, where individual attitudes become societal attitudes, societal beliefs, societal behaviours, and policy sometimes. And it's when those stereotypes have a pejorative, um, a negative bias, that you get stigma, and that's where we really, really have a problem. I want to talk a bit about the roots of stigma and social housing, some of the evidence around it, and perhaps what some of the problems are before handing on to Martin to suggest some of the solutions. You get to do the nice positive bit, Martin. <laughs> um, but before I do, I, I just want to say that what I'm not going to do is repeat the stereotypes. There's an organisation called the Frameworks Institute, which very wisely says myth busting doesn't work. Because if you repeat the stereotype, all you've done is said it one more time, put it in people's minds again. And we're not here to do that. What I will do is think about the roots of stigma and negative stereotypes around social housing. And it, it takes me back to the start of the, the See the Person campaign, when a few of us who live uh, and work in social housing were sat around in Oxford with um, a guy called Danny Dawling, who's a prof at um, Oxford University. And he said something that's really stuck with me. He said, um, we love the NHS because we all use it. We're out the flipping front door clapping for it, aren't we? We like state education because 90% of us send our kids to it or went there ourselves. Social housing has a problem because 17% of the population live in it. That's down from about 30%. Um, if you look back kind of 30, 40 years ago, 30% of the population lived in social housing, mainly council housing. That figure is now around 17%. So when I see something negative or pejorative in the media or I hear someone say something negative, the chances are I don't have any contact with social housing. I don't have any personal experience to tackle that with. The kind of common sense um, 
that hopefully we all apply when we see things on the internet might not kick in if you don't have that personal connection. So there's something around the, the supply of social housing and arguably the residualization of it, because the demand is still there, isn't it? Demand for social housing has not gone away. Arguably, it's more so now than it ever has been. But the supply is less. So people don't have the relationship with it and rely more, arguably, on um, the, the stereotypes they, they may see. But what's the evidence for this? Well, the See the Person campaign, originally Benefit Society, did um, a, a numerous bits of research. One piece was with YouGov, and they found that the public consistently overestimates the link between social housing and unemployment. There is um, something in people's mind that links the two. Yet, the English Housing Survey shows 70% of people living in social housing are employed or retired. Actually, the figure for unemployment is 6.4%. Um, and the other people are um, unable to work due to uh, caring responsibilities, study responsibilities or disability. The research also showed that nine out of 10 people living in social housing have experienced stigma around who happens to own the property in which they live, who owns their home. The most common type of stigma experience is very direct and very local. It's the neighbor, the person over the road, um, someone at church, someone at the school gate. But people also said they have very strongly felt stigma from politicians locally and nationally of any political colour. That They've heard it from the media, the TV, news, um, kind of poverty porn type programmes. And, and this is the one that really, really disappoints me from their landlord, from their housing association, from their council, from staff, whose wages they pay through their rent. That's the bit that always gets me that I find really, really disappointing and actually feel pretty angry about. The impact of this stigma is also clear. Oh, it would be if I could find the quote on my screen. Um, there are uh, three levels of, of impact that the campaign uh, recognised. One is individual, and I just want to read you a couple of quotes. One respondent to a survey said, it makes you feel ashamed and embarrassed when people ask where you live or where you come from. Someone else said, um, I don't mention in conversation that I live in social housing. And the one that really got me, this word worthless came up. I'm made to feel worthless. Tell people they're worthless enough times and they'll start to believe it, said one respondent. There's a community impact as well. And I remember one journalist talking about um, she, she'd grown up um, in council housing. and She's a housing association tenant now. And she said... She, when she'd been out with colleagues, if the story was from um, a, a council housing area or social housing area, the colleague would stay in the car and say, go on, you, you can deal with this. You're all right. I'll, I'll just stay and look after the car, shall I? Just absolutely mind blowing prejudice from people who are writing the stories and writing the, the, the news. One more minute, please, Catherine. Yeah, no worries. And societal, because how do we make the case for more social housing if that's how people perceive it? So Martin will talk for a second about recommendations, but I do want to say before I finish that um, language is spoken about a lot. Framing of social housing is spoken about a lot, and that's really, really important. But it's not the only thing that's important. It's what lies beneath that language. Back to my question at the opening about the pandemic, I want to just mention an article written by Tony Stacey, Chief Exec of South Yorkshire Housing Association, about how many times landlords have used the word vulnerable, vulnerable people, in, over the last six months, and how we have framed it to look like the heroes riding in on white charges to save our vulnerable tenants. Well, the truth, the facts don't stack up um, to, to, to back that up. Certainly where I am, we've done pulse surveys with tenants and 80% of tenants have helped out a neighbor, someone else in their area, a family member, and around 80% have received help from the same. That community resilience we're seeing needs to be recognised in the way we're talking about the pandemic and the way we're talking about society at large. That's not to say we shouldn't be in there helping, of course we should, but to touch on a theme that Darren raised, I think the action beneath it needs to be around working with people, not doing to them, and making sure our language and our actions um, both reflect that. Martin, I hope I haven't taken up um, too much of your time, if any, and thanks very much. Fear not, it will all fit in. Thanks, Kath. So let's go straight away to hear from Martin Lund, 
Chair of See the Person and Chair of the Tenant Overview and Scrutiny Panel at Kettering Borough Council. Martin, over to you. Thank you, John. Yes, um, so uh, like I said, I'm Martin Lund. I am the Chair of See the Person campaign. Um, I'm also a member of ARCH, which is the Association of Retained Council Housing. So See the Person. See the Person is a uh, tenant-led national campaign and we've got members all over the country. Um, we continuously work with CIH, TPAS and ARCH as well as uh, many uh, social housing providers. Um, we have meetings um, regularly with the MHCLG. Um, recently we, was, we had a meeting with them and we was talking about the, um, the Inman white bike paper but we'll see what happens when that comes out. Um, the see the person has had uh, discussions, like I said, with the MACLG, and we've got six asks of government, and I just want to read them to you now. Um, so, number one, uh, the see the person believe that the government should explore discrimination on the grounds of social economic status. This would help tackle segregation and new developments postcode discrimination and help people to tackle all stigma that they perceive by stating clearly that this is not acceptable. Number two, we want the government and indeed all political parties to take action when it's their own politicians using stereotyping language about social housing and the people whose homes are, so, are, are social housing. Number three, wherever the idealistic basis around home ownership, please stop talking always about ownership as the ultimate goal. We need government to recognise the value and importance of good quality, truly affordable rented homes. Number four, we, ask, we are asking the government to fund a national study to look at the paid and voluntary work done by people living in social housing. We believe that people who live in social housing contribute significantly and would like this quantified to, to the end. Um, to, to the end. Number five, uh, we would like the government to reintroduce a tenant empowerment fund or something similar to support the national networking and skills. And lastly, we call upon the government to invest in democracy and investigate why voting levels are lower for people that live in social housing uh, than, than any other tender. Uh, we would ask to set up a youth advisory panel to listen and to look at young people's views who live in social housing. We are in support of the Shelter Commission and we call for social housing uh, to be a real voice for tenants. So that's just some of our asks, what we have been asking for with government. Um, like I said, we are continuously working with CIH and we have just recently uh, done our guide, which you can download if you go onto our website, find it on Twitter, various ways. It's a guide um, to uh, tackle stigma in social housing. Um, and it's called It's Not OK. Uh, so what did we do? So first of all, we did a survey, which we, we asked tenants uh, to give their views um, of how, what they think stigma is and what we can do to tackle it. Just a couple of the comments that come out of the survey, really. You can look at it yourself. Um, tenants feel like uh, sometimes people that work in social housing believe that they know more about living in social housing than the people that actually live in social housing. Um, when signing up for tenancies, it is assumed that people are always on benefits and they're single parents. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, the assumption that we are all scroungers and that we are in our homes 24 hours a day, just waiting for that knock on the door when contractors or people come along uh, to do repairs. And all this is, is just not the case. Um, there's a lot more that's come out of the survey and please have a look at it and 
uh, work with us with, with that. I think uh, Catherine touched earlier about some of the, the stats around what people perceive, you know, uh, with, with, with stigma. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, the guide talks about um, things that we want to stop, really. So stop talking down to tenants. Stop making assumptions about tenants. Um, stop being disrespectful of tenants about their homes and their communities. Um, don't use us as a tick box. You know, we're not there to say, oh, we've involved tenants. That's not what we're here, and it's not why I do what I do. Uh, stop being uncaring um, and failing to follow through, ducking out of difficult issues. And um, we want you to start, start treating as you want to be treated with respect. Listen and appreciate and act on tenants' concerns. Keep people informed with a, a range of ways to communicate. We want you to start to improve the quality of our homes and the our estates and have skilled, professional uh, and well-trained staff. So there's much more that we can do. We are continuously, like I said, we are working with all social housing providers and I myself have various meetings with councils and um, housing associations as well as the MHCLG, which I said earlier. But there's much more that you can do. This is a second guide that we have produced. Our first guide was a journalist guide just to tackle stigma. So please have a look at both of these guides. Um, we continuously need your support. So please support, support the campaign. And we are always looking donation, for donations so we can continue the good work that all the panel members of See The Person do. So please get in touch, please support the campaign and we will welcome your donations. Thank you. Martin, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. I think my reflection on that from, from somebody, I suppose, who, who works deep inside the machine is that, is that you've talked, the two of you have talked about the sort of societal stigma that gets attached to um, the people who live in social housing. And we see this reflected a lot in um, both the how services are delivered, um, but perhaps also in, in the culture that exists within organisations. So we still see lots of parent and child cultures where the, the landlord is, the, is often the complaining parent, complaining about the, the behaviour of the, of the, uh, of the residents. Um, and it's, it's simply not an adult to adult relationship where both sides have got responsibilities that they need to live up to. Um, so, yeah, I, I really recognise the things that you're saying um, as, as being accurate in many ways. Um, so thanks for that. Um, we've, we haven't got any questions to put at this point. We've got had an interesting point that, that was made, though, in the Q&A, which, which I just read out. Attitudes to social housing where I work are very much divided. Part, it, part using it as part of wider efforts for emergency accommodation for people with drug and alcohol issues has damaged the perception of new social housing tenants with our existing ones and in mixed tenure blocks. Still very much valued by our existing tenants and seen as tenure of choice and something to still be proud of and pleased to be part of. I think that's a really interesting observation about, about the fact that the people who are rising to the top of lists are in, going to have increasingly high um, uh, support needs, um, but also, it's, it's also a, a relatively divisive view of the world, isn't it? Um, and and um, stigma flourishes on division is, is the observation I would make. But let's, let's keep going. Um, next up, it's time to hear, hear now from Nicky Morby. Nicky has been working on these issues for many years and often leads CT's delivery of works on resident engagement. So, Niku, what are the evolving methods that we can use to enable us to gain more and better insight into what customers want? OK, thanks very much indeed, John. And uh, so what I'm going to do is to go back to basics and talk uh, and use Catherine's uh, words about 
language being really, really important and, and therefore understanding what customer engagement is all about because that's what I, I'm going to talk about today. And customer engagement is actually an ongoing interaction between landlords and residents. And it's something that landlords offer, but often forget that it's actually something chosen by the customer. They decide how they want to interact with landlords on their terms and in areas that they would like to engage with landlords. And so coming back to Catherine, your point about language, if we simply said these are conversations, wouldn't that make better sense to everybody? I just question that. Um, so the regulator, and uh, um, Darren, you talked about the regulator, and the regulator requires uh, registered providers and local authority providers as well uh, to, to ensure that tenants are given the opportunities to influence and get involved in a range of things. And you've got to be really be able to demonstrate how residents are helping to formulate your housing related policies, your strategic priorities, how you're de delivering your services and setting service standards. And in particular, giving residents the, the opportunities to, to, to test your performance. And you can also agree local offers so that's what the regulator tells you, but the regulator does not tell registered providers and social landlords how to do it. That is left to us as organizations. And I think that's a really important point to remember because what's happened in the last few years is we've all gone away and set up scrutiny panels. And I'll come back to this a little bit, little bit more without necessarily understanding whether scrutiny and how that structure is going to work in our organizations. So we've actually sometimes taken that one size fits approach. And the other thing that we come across quite a lot is that the regulator specifically expects landlords to consult their residents at least once every three years about how people want to get involved. And, and, and organizations often have five, seven year resident engagement strategies, well, that is a, a possible failure here. But I want to also go back to what's worked really well. And you will remember that in the 90, late 19, um, uh, 1990s, uh, when we had the, the consultation about what should happen to council housing, hordes and hordes and hordes of tenants got involved in those discussions. Why did they take that chance? Why did they get involved? It's because there was a subject that really, really mattered to them. And that's why they got involved. And, and that tells us that people, there's a willingness out there, but we need to make sure that we engage people on things that really matter to them. Um, I think the other thing positive is that landlords have generally made participation a lot easier. Long gone are the days when we were inviting people to attend uh, uh, meetings at seven o'clock in the evening in, in cold, horrible community halls uh, when, when families were busy, you know. So we've actually got away a lot from that and that's a real, real positive aspect. I think there is recognition that voice of the customer matters, but there is still a long way to go. So why, is, why are we in the position we are when actually in the 1996 Housing Act, we were all told that customer voice is important. The, the improvements that, that have been made are about the ways to get engaged and that's great. And I think there needs to be a balance about offline engagement and, and online engagement. You will always need those coffee mornings in perhaps your sheltered housing schemes, your, your special needs schemes. You'll always have a need for those, but actually that menu needs to be a balance between online and offline. And talking about online, um, John and I often talk about the fact that whenever we engage with uh, EE, you get a series of questions when you completed your transaction. Well, by screen five, we've actually lost the plot and we've, we've got out of the survey. And, and actually, is there something to be learned from there? Because tenants are no different than you and I. Our attention span is quite short often when we are busy people. 
And why should one expect, and Martin, you're absolutely right, why should one expect that tenants have got all the time, time in the world? I think I want to come back to the, the wider aspect of engagement then. And I want to describe this as a party. There's a party which is led by information-based engagement. So I know about this party, I'm very happy to join it, but on my terms, only if you actually offer something that I like in that party, otherwise I'm not interested. And so you need to find ways in which to engage with me in a way that suits me. And that's called a menu of engagement. There's consultation-based uh, engagement. And this is where I'm coming to the party because I'm interested in the subject. I'm likely to meet like-minded people and there's actually a common purpose. So you're hooking me at that point. And, 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 and this might be one-off, this might be an ongoing task and finish group, Whatever it is, it's consultation based where you are getting my views and you're going to be using those views to, demo and to, 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 to arrive at decision making. Then there's the endorsement based, we call it scrutiny. And I'm attending the party, I'm not just attending it, but I'm also going to help you to arrange this party. It's a different mindset therefore, you know. Um, and, and so we've got all these structures and, and website after website after website that I test for housing associations and local authorities often include these kind of menus, but there are limitations within that as well. Um, so for example, if learning from the NHS, if we actually said scrutiny is about using the expert voice. In the NHS, they have something called experts by experience. And that means that you're talking to people who are really using your services. And that doesn't just go for scrutiny, it goes for any form of engagement. So if you want to consult tenants about antisocial behavior, consult people who have actually used your policies and your procedures, who've experienced antisocial behavior. You know, if you want to consult people about domestic abuse, don't talk to me because I don't know what it's about. I've never, never been abused like that, you know. So it's about finding the right people. And here are the three big ticket items that I think would make a difference. Firstly, in organizations, there's often not a single individual high level person that is responsible for looking at all customer insights collectively. We're all very good at looking at those individual surveys, individual complaints, but actually customer insight needs to be looked at all angles from that customer's perspective. So it's fine for me to talk about my responsive repair service and give you a quick text message uh, response, but how does that then marry up with your routine surveys? How does that marry up with your annual service? How does that marry up with your own staff, repair staff telling you what, what it's like on the ground? Does it all marry up with your data, for example? And so one of the issues we've got is that we are often as organizations very data rich, but actually information poor. And if we could use that, that information, if they, we could use the customer insight, that would be great. The other issue we often have is that we are actually not counting and making every contact count. So it wouldn't be a million miles out of your way if you actually said, do you know, thank you, Mrs. Morby for your call. I'm just waiting for my screen to come up. In the meantime, can I just ask you a very quick question? What's it like living in our home? It's as simple as that, you know, uh, and, and you could actually make every contact count that way. How often do I come across organizations where we do this wonderful six weekly uh, in settling in visits with our new tenants? It's our new relationship with a new tenant and how often do we say to people at the end of six months, do you know we've got this really group going, would you like to join us? Would you like to take part in this survey? We are often very focused on what was that experience like for you for the moving in process, but we're not opening doors and windows at that point. The second biggest issue I think is customer engagement is not everybody's job in a lot of organizations. In other words, customer engagement is 
is often the add-on and nice to have. So we have these wonderful strategic plans, five-year plans, we have annual delivery plans, and rarely do we see, well, if the asset management team is going to be regenerating this area, we need to put engagement and scrutiny at the forefront of that. One more minute, please, Nikki. Thank you. So engagement in that sense is really important. And final bit is about customer scrutiny. It is reliant on too few people. It is, these are long and often quite boring uh, processes to go through. And if we had very, very quick scrutiny uh, uh, processes, uh, rather like citizens' juries that have been set up across Europe, wouldn't that be fantastic? So we've got citizens' juries in Vienna, for example, where volunteers ask the questions, and there's actually a, a group of people that look at that evidence, the real practical evidence instead of performance, performance reports that go on for 60 pages. There are no magic bullets, but we need to do a lot more. Uh, we need to make sure engagement is timely, it is appropriate, it is fair and inclusive. And on that final point, if I, we started by with the basis that every tenant is a hard to reach tenant, just as I am in my life, then I then make sure that I'm reaching out to everybody and then deciding which are the harder to reach communities. Um, so if you wanted to capture people's views, you could actually use community services, you could use schools. I've certainly used school, uh, uh, parent teacher, uh, uh, Facebook pages to get, get information out of people. So I think there is a lot more for, that we can do, great opportunities ahead. And it's timely that the NHF code of governance is going to, going to seek for, for, for greater transparency and accountability between boards and residents and the, the NHF together with Tenants Charter is going to really, really make a difference, I think. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of observations from me, I think. Well, an observation and then, and then a, an interesting question has been, been, been asked. Um, for me, I think a part, reflecting back to the, the subject of stigma earlier, um, for many years, we used to see obstacles put in the way of greater levels of digital engagement by organizations saying, well, of course, our residents haven't got access to the internet, not in the same way that I have. And it wasn't true then, and it isn't true now. Um, but I think at long last, organizations are accepting that the levels of digital access are such that um, they need to think about how they will offer opportunities for people to engage who do not have digital access, but that they can rely on the fact that the vast majority um, do. And then there was an interesting question that came in, which is, where is it gone? Is uh, Claire Monk, thanks Claire. Is digital engagement making tenant involvement easier or more difficult? Our TI staff are saying the recruitment of re uh, representative tenants has become more difficult since COVID. Well, I, I think my observation on that would be, it's not a magic bullet. It can definitely get you at more people, but it will still, there'll still be a heavy dependency on how you're using those channels. What we've tended to do over time has been to um, grab hold of people who express an interest and, and um, vastly overload them with expectations of what, we should, what they should contribute. And so um, there's been this, um, hamster wheel of, of uh, that we put residents on, tire them out with mountains of paperwork, and then they fall off it a couple of years later, never to get back on it. And uh, so I think that we need to think about how we use digital access channels to gain understanding of what lives are like for residents and, and how organisations could serve them better, but not to um, overload them simply because they've taken a step forward to be engaged. Um, let's keep moving. We're on time, amazingly. Um, so our final speaker, last and definitely not least, we have Richard Blakeway. Uh, Richard took on the role of Housing Ombudsman 14 months ago and can talk to us now about the new powers in the revised Housing Ombudsman scheme that took effect from the 1st of September this year. Richard, over to you. Um, brilliant. Thanks very much, John. And hello, everyone. 
Um, I, and I've really enjoyed listening to uh, the other speakers and to the discussion so far. I want to make um, three um, brief points. Um, so uh, and they cover communication, transparency and governance. So if I um, touch on the first one around communication. So when someone makes a complaint, it's often quite an emotional experience. It can be quite an emotional experience. The, um, the nature of housing complaints are very different to perhaps the complaints that you might make uh, elsewhere. They're not transa transactional necessarily. You're not, this is not a, a complaint, you know, perhaps about your lender or something that you bought. It's a very, um, you know, a, an item that you bought. It can be a very, very uh, intense and, 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 as I say, emotional experience. Therefore, key to that, to managing that uh, experience is communication. And notwithstanding um, the effectiveness of some of the communication that we've seen during the last few months uh, during this this uh, during the COVID uh, nineteen period, I'm struck time and time again how communication and channels of communication and effective communication and timely communication can break down um, during the journey of a complaint or where an issue has arisen. Last week, for example, we published um, a report on um, uh, findings of severe maladministration where we identified um, five landlords and detailed five cases where, um, where that happened. Now, look, this is a handful of findings that we, we make each year that fall into that most serious uh, category of um, severe maladministration. But what's so striking with those cases, particularly, you know, they run over, many of those cases would happen over many, many years, was how communication had fundamentally broken down. Uh, and that had obviously meant that both something wasn't fixed more speedily, but also the experience of the individual and the distress that the individual experienced was, was, was greater. So one of the ways in which we want to try and uh, set a Sets, sets standards and set a, a consistent approach is through the complaint handling code that we published this summer, where we're hoping where it touches on engagement, it touches on communication, fundamentally it touches on getting the right culture within organisations around complaint handling. We have a diverse range of members, 2,300 landlords belong to us. It's a hugely diverse range from councils to cooperatives. Um, and, 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 and getting that code in place, it's the, you know, quite a new thing for us to do as an organisation, but getting that code in place, I think for us is a critical way in which we can hopefully support the sector to handle complaints um, more effectively. Um, the second area I wanted to touch on was transparency. Um, you, as an organisation, I think it's important to kind of demystify the role of an ombudsman. We're not a regulator, we're not the courts, um, but trying to explain our role uh, and ensure that we're open and accessible and that there's greater awareness of us are, are all key, key things. Part of that, I think, is the, the role that transparency plays in the, in the decisions that we make and the information that, and the data that we hold on organisations. I think it's key, actually, to, to ensure that there are effective uh, complaint uh, complaint handling, because you can see the difference that they can make. It gives confidence, it builds trust. It should hopefully support the landlord-tenant relationship. Um, so we're going through a process of greater transparency, and you've seen some of that so far with us publishing more reports, more individual decisions, and that will continue. We will uh, be publishing uh, reports on individual landlords, all, all, all our member landlords where we've handled complaints during a year, um, soon, as well as all of our individual decisions in 2021. And that will continue. I think that's a key part of building uh, the role of an ombudsman and the role of complaints within organisations. And then the third point which I wanted to touch on was around um, governance. And in a way, it's a bit broader than governance. But the point that I want to make is that um, when we publish the complaint handling code and some of the other work that we've been doing, we've been keen to emphasize the role that different individuals play within an organization to make sure that there is the right culture and that complaint handling is effective. It's not just the preserve of frontline staff or the complaint handling team. We all have a role to play on it. Everyone should have a role to play on it um, within an organization. And that means boards too. 
And we're particularly keen to emphasize the role um, that boards um, should perform on, 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 on gathering and demonstrating the learning that's come from complaints during the year. Where there have been failures, I think being able to demonstrate that lessons have been learned, that practices may have changed, that policies may have changed, is really, really important. And I think the role of boards is essential towards that. One of the things which we've asked with the complaint handling code, for example, is that the self-assessment is reported to the board. And actually, I've seen some really good examples of that. The, uh, there is a, a, a landlord based in the northeast that was telling us that it brought together a resident group to conduct the self-assessment and that self -asse against the code. That self-assessment will be reported to that landlord's main board. It's a really good example of using the code to engage with residents, as well as ensuring that the board is performing the role that it should be uh, playing on, um, on, on leading around, uh, around complaints. So this is um, something which we'll, we'll, we'll be doing more on um, as we go forward. I think it's key also because, and, and doubtless it, you know, there'll be a tension on this uh, going forward, the, the, we get many questions about our role alongside the role of the social housing regulator. And um, the revi revisions to the scheme, which John uh, mentioned, allow, gives us a broader basis on which we can refer uh, individual cases or refer landlords to, um, to the regulator. But we want to be proportionate in the way that we do that. One of the key ways of us demonstrating that we are being proportionate is giving the landlord the opportunity to put something right first. And again, that comes back to us potentially referring to the board of the landlord rather uh, before we refer to the regulator and hopefully we won't have to refer to the regulator because we'll get an adequate response from the board so it all fits in as part of that changing culture that we want to see around complaints and the demonstration that effective complaint handling make, can make a difference to individuals but they also um, operate on an organizational white basis they're an insight into the effectiveness the health the performance of an organization um, they're a window into an organisation, particularly at, potentially at times of crisis. They can show you something unforeseen that might not be put up elsewhere. And that's why they play such a, a key role within an organisation. Um, and that's something which we want to do as, uh, a, 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 and do more on as an ombudsman. Um, to, to I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, John. Thank you very much indeed. That's really, really helpful. Um, just to give you a chance to draw breath, Richard, uh, we've, we've, we've got a question that, uh, that I'll put first to Darren. Um, have tarot shaped innovative ways with residents to engage differently based on the reality of lockdowns? Um, Darren? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I've been busily, um, there's been lots of questions being coming in. I've been busily answering all of them. And this was one where I clicked the wrong button and couldn't couldn't quite um, un answer it as a, as a written response. So, um, yeah, we've worked with a number of organisations. The one which comes to mind um, off the top of my head um, is uh, Radian and um, Yarlington, who are now Abbey, um, have definitely, they've been providing uh, laptops to their scrutiny members and some training um, and engage on, on kind of Zoom platforms to enable people to be able to engage. In some respects, though, it's kind of, it's great that they're doing it, but then at the same time, um, a lot of other organisations I know have been doing that sort of thing for a number of years. And I guess what I would say is, is always have a think about what it, what it is that you're doing, what objectives you're trying to achieve when you're doing the, when you're setting about engaging, and actually, are you the best uh, placed organisation or body to actually be communicating some of those messages? Certainly, in the uh, Hackett review, um, one of the things that came about was that landlords was one of the least trusted organisations, um, and if and uh, if you compare that, say, to the to the to the local fire brigade. So have a think about who what, who is the messenger of some of them of some of those communications because it might not always be that the landlord is the most trusted or is the is the best place to be able to 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 deliver some of those messages. And an example of that where so so sometimes peer to peer type activities can be much more powerful and can be much more far reaching. So uh, an example uh, before I close uh, was. 
Um, I'm aware of some of the work of Ledbury Action Group, uh, what they've been doing. Uh, some key individuals from that though got involved with Tower Blocks UK. They then went and got some additional funding and they've produced an online tool called Fix My Block. It's really great, but it's, a, it's an idea it, and, and it's a resource for, for tenants uh, to be able to go on and, and empower themselves to take action. And it, that's the kind of way where actually you can precipitate more powerful uh, and meaningful outcomes and, and the landlord's not really been party to that whatsoever. Um, so ha have a think about stepping back before you kind of just go about traditional approaches because there might be other ways that you can kind of facilitate um, and achieve greater outcomes. Thanks very much for that, Darren. I, I, I guess my observation would be I think just about every executive team that we talk to is looking at each other across the table and they're, they're asking themselves what lessons they've learned from COVID. Um, and generally they've learned that they uh, underestimated um, the potential they had in their teams to, to move mountains to keep services going over a short, in difficult circumstances. Um, and I would argue that, that organisations should be asking themselves those, those same questions about their residents, because the same positive lessons that can be taken from about your staff can be taken about your residents. And then the other big question that exec teams are asking themselves is how do we stop the old ways from reasserting themselves? And I think that that is equally pertinent in terms of how you, you know, we've learned that all sorts of doors have been kicked open by the COVID experience and uh, organizations need to be walking through them, not only in terms of their service delivery, but also in terms of their relationships with, with tenants. Um, Richard, a question for you, if I may. It seems to me that many of, the, of your findings are only made possible if the people delivering the service believe themselves different to the people being served. Um, so how do you perceive the issue of attitude stigma playing into your caseload? Um, okay, so we, um, each year, let, let me just give a bit of context, um, first of all. So each year we handle, we, we, we um, conduct about 2,000 formal investigations and, and produce reports. And typically we've had a maladministration rate of about 38%, 38, 39%. So um, a maladministration will cover a, a range of uh, a range of findings. So sometimes it will be service failure through to severe maladministration. So in the majority of the investigations that we conduct, that something hasn't gone wrong. Um, I think one of the uh, key issues, and this has um, particularly come uh, to the forefront when we've been um, testing our approaches to mediation, one of the areas that we want to develop as a service is mediation is trying to break down a kind of defensiveness in relation to a complaint or where we're, or where we're handling an issue. Um, we have, as a service, quite uh, an extensive uh, dispute, what we call a dispute support service, where we have advisor, a helpline and advisors who are working on complaints, providing advice to both residents and landlords prior to the complaint exhausting the landlord's process. And we try, and a lot of that is about just trying to get engagement. It's straightforward things around trying to get engagement. But then when something has exhausted the landlord's process, one of the areas which we want to try and develop more, and it's won't, at the moment that not many cases go through this, but we want to grow it, is, is, um, is mediation. And we've tested different forms of mediation over the years, and we want to expand it further. And initially, we can often find quite, quite a defensiveness and complaints processes can be used, used sometimes to kind of defend policy. And actually trying to get that sort of openness has been, uh, I think, a really important part for us to, uh, you know, really put important part of the mediation role that we can play, potentially. Uh, and also strengthening that and rebuilding, even rebuilding that tenant-landlord relationship, where the relationship has been fundamentally undermined through the, you know, the, the, because an issue hasn't been addressed. So I think uh, in terms of attitudes, I would say trying to overcome defensiveness is a key thing, and it can be a barrier to resolution, uh, and it can be a barrier to effective remedies. Um, 
and, 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 and for me, I think there's definitely roles in which the way in which we're resolving complaints can support uh, the, the, the sort of loosening, the lessening of defensiveness. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I've had a question from my colleague, Sue Harvey. Yeah, I know um, Sue. <laughs> who, uh, who, of course, is, is often working with landlords who are on the wrong side of the uh, regulatory regime for, for, for whatever reason. Uh, and Sue's question is on that point. Could you elaborate a little more about the changing relationship with the regulator? When might you refer a case or landlord to the regulator? Cool. Um, firstly, hello, Sue. Uh, <laughs> so there are, um, as, uh, there are three ways in which we can refer a case to the, um, to the regulator, which I'm sure you know. So um, the first is um, on non-compliance. Um, the second is where we um, have a uh, systemic issue. Um, we're concerned about, um, you know, something which may, uh, um, you know, may have um, um, built up over a period of time within the landlord. We're, fi we're finding similar uh, cases, so we can refer something because it's systemic. Um, and we're also referring where we um, find uh, severe maladministration, so, as I touched on earlier. Uh, until recently, we were until the new scheme came into effect in September, we were only able to refer on the basis of uh, non-compliance, of which there is very little. Um, so under the 96 Housing Act, our orders have to be complied with by landlords, and 95% of compliance happens within three months of the order being made. Uh, or, or, uh, um, I think uh, I think one of the Key things, though, uh, which I touched on, is how we are proportionate in the way that we use that power. It should be a last resort when we refer to the regulator. Uh, and that's why we want to give the landlord an opportunity to put something right first. If necessary, we'll escalate it to the board or elected members to, to, to get uh, an appropriate response. Um, the other thing um, which I touch on is, obviously, that's the kind of formal bit of... Uh, 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 of the relationship between the two organizations. The informal uh, sharing of information, I think is a really fundamental and key part of the relationship. Um, what trends are we seeing? What kind of intelligence do we have? And I think that feeds into a, a range of work that the regulator does. And I think is actually a really, really key and more extensive part of our, of our two roles. Brilliant. One more technical question, uh, just literally come in as you were speaking. Um, can you cl clarify or give an example of maladministration? Um, yeah, I mean, mal so um, uh, the, you'll see in the scheme where um, how we set out our different um, findings um, following an investigation. And, um, and the categories in which that falls. So we can find a full maladministration that can include severe maladministration. We can find partial maladministration. That's where um, if there's three elements to a complaint, there may be maladministration in relation to one of them. And we can also find service failure, which is included within um, maladministration. Um, but it, it's service failure is a kind of lesser level of, of maladministration. Our decision making is on the basis of a range of information. Um, so some of it will include housing law, some of it will critically involve um, uh, the policies of the landlord um, itself. Um, it will involve the, the contracts, um, the tenancy agreement and so on. So we make out, so the evidence that informs our findings so is quite rich and quite broad. And the approach that we take, and, and this is, a, I think, a really, really important thing about an ombudsman, is an inquisitorial um, approach. Um, so whereas if you go through a legal process, it will be adversarial, we're, we're taking an inquisitorial approach where we're there, we're in, impartial, we're seeking to be fair, um, and we'll make findings which are based on um, the individual circumstances and what's fair in all the circumstances. And that finding of maladministration will be based on that richness of evidence. It will be based on how the landlord uh, made its uh, decisions um, um, in relation to its policies. What did it do? Uh, and it will also be based on what's fair in all the circumstances and in particular the individual circumstances. Um, so which is why it's always hard, I think, to take precedent from the findings that we make. 
because the individual circumstances means that what's on the face of it looks like similar cases or similar circumstances may actually be different, which is why we can reach different findings and, and more importantly, different remedies depending on those individual circumstances. Richard, that's really helpful. Thank you very much.